For many of you, never heard of the Great Zimbabwe Empire, but you're gonna learn something today, and I'm telling you, it has been a long journey to get here. The great enclosure, it was the resident or first wife of the king. And the duty of first wife just to teach those young girls who had puberty stage how to behave when we get married. Hey, what's going on everybody? I am here at the Great Zimbabwe site in Zimbabwe. For many of you, never heard of the Great Zimbabwe Empire, but you're gonna learn something today, and I'm telling you, it has been a long journey to get here. I'm so glad I'm here, and we're gonna be talking to Gifty. Gifty's gonna give us the history of the Great Zimbabwe Empire, the Great Zimbabwe site, the Great Enclosure, and, uh, and so much. So thank you, Gifty. Uh, let's talk. Let's, let's walk it down for us. Okay, good people. Uh, let me call it a warm welcome to Great Zimbabwe, World Heritage Site and also a national monument. Once again, my name is Gift. I'm going to be your guide for the next uh, one hour. This is our site map showing the areas I'm going to cover. Basically, Great Zimbabwe is subdivided into three architectural concentric zones. We have what to call the hill, valley, as well as great enclosure. At the present moment, we are standing at the information center. So from here, our first part, of course, is going to be the main structure, which is known as the Great Enclosure. This is the biggest historical structure yet in Great Zimbabwe, which exhibits the best workmanship of Great Zimbabwe builders. It stands about 255 meters in its circumference, 11 meters up in other side, especially eastern side, then five to six meters width at the base, then progressively thinner at the top, about two to three meters wide, just to maintain stability. If you came to Zimbabwe, to visit Great Zimbabwe, automatically you are not in Zimbabwe because the name of the country originated from here. So from Great Enclosure, we pass through the valley straight to the Karanga village. Karanga village is just a model setup which try to depict Shona lifestyle and tradition, how Shona people lived during those golden ancient days. We are going to witness a group of traditional dance, men performing stone carving and wood carvings, while to women performing portraits as well as basket weaving. So it's like a Shona ethnographic way of living. Then from Karanga, I'm going to sum up our tour inside our site museum. Inside our site museum, that's where I'm going to witness many artifacts which were retrieved within or around Great Zimbabwe, including eight famous soapstone carvings of Zimbabwean birds. Then from site museum back to the information center, we can call it a day. I hope you are going to enjoy the tour as much as I enjoy your company. All right, well, thank you, Gifty. All right, everybody. You're going on an adventure inside of the Great Zimbabwe Empire. Come on, let's go. Thank you. Okay, so I know people named Gifty, but yours is Gift. Yes, Gift. Uh, gift in our vernacular language is known as uh, Chipo. Chipo is a female given name. Okay. So Gift is uh, most common in and boys or men. Gift. Yes, gift. Without yeah. the E. Gift. Yes. Not gifty. Yes. And so uh, in German, it's gift is known as poison. In Germany, gift means poison. But in England. In English, means present. Present. Yes. So we know present. We know if somebody gives a gift. Yes. Uh... So this is it. Yeah, that's the main structure. The Great Enclosure. All right, good people. I just want to give you a brief history of Great Zimbabwe so that by the end of our tour, your thirst about Great Zimbabwe is going to be quenched. Uh, Great Zimbabwe, it's an archaeological site that brings many questions pertaining to its origin, who, why, and when it was built. Basically, the site was built and occupied around 1200 to 1600 AD by the Bantu people. And these people, they were believed to be emanated as far as East Africa, where we have countries like Tanzania, 
the original name for Tanzania is known as Tanganyika. Yes. But according to Malcolm Mugatri, a British linguistic, he traces that these people, they emanate from central part of Africa in Katanga region of Zaire, now present day DRC. And they were cattle rangers, owning large numbers of cattle. To such an extent that mythology is yes, to say an ordinary person would own around 1,000 beasts. So by that situation, they were forced into nomadic nature, mm -hmm. itinerant way of living, seeking for grazing pastures and natural resources. So they decided to move from that part of Africa, going southwards, by the movement historically known as Bantu migration. Okay. When we are talking of Bantu, we are talking of the group of black people who are genetically, culturally, and linguistically connected. Bantu is an umbrella term, and a Bantu they have different dialects. That's why we have Karanga, Zezuru, Ndau, Manyika, Tonga, Chewa, Venda, the Kalanga speaking community in Botswana, and Devele, eh, Swahili, just to mention but a few. Before the arrival of the Bandu speaking community in Southern Africa, there was the Sen and the Koi Koi. These people, they are latest Stone Age people, they were not involved in domestication of animals and crop husbandry. Men lived in caves, hunters and gatherers. So due to competition of space, the band would end up forced the Sen and the Koi Koi to move from Zimbabwe to Western Namibia and Western Botswana, now present day. And the intermarriage between the Koi Koi and the Sen, they bear an offspring which is known as Koi San. With their women very light in complexion, with a big outstanding feature, now the distinct part of Kalahari and the Namib Desert. Hmm. And the first settlement to be constructed by the Bandu people is known as Mapungubwe in South Africa. Right now, between Shashe and Limpopo rivers, Mapungubwe is the predecessor to Great Zimbabwe, and it was constructed between 5th to 8th century. Then the decline was peddling around the end of the 18th century due to climatic changes. So soon after the demise of uh, Mapungubwe, people started to migrate northwards, coming to Great Zimbabwe. At the peak of its power and prosperity, a town had a population of more than 25,000 adults. Great Zimbabwe it was a polygamous state. The last king by its name Nyatsimba Mutota was believed to have about 200 wives. Woo. So he was a very, very busy man. Very busy. Yes, according to our Shona culture, life is time and tradition. During that time, to have more wives to a symbol of wealthy and also prestige. But nowadays, it's food for thought. It's food for thought. Yes. It's food for thought. Yes. And uh, Great Zimbabwe it was built into threefold state. It was built as cultural center, political center, and a religious center for almost the southern central Africa. It was a capital city in sub-Saharan Africa, which stretches, touches part of Botswana. In Dombo Shawa and Mujojo, just close to Francis Town, we have similar structures as compared to Great Zimbabwe. Part of Mozambique in Gamba Kingdom and Manikeni in Mozambique. And part of South Africa in Mapungubwe, Tulamela and Zata in Limpopo province of South Africa. So from those areas, the vassal chiefs, they end up came here with the tribute in form of gold, animal skins, ivory, iron tools to the paramount king as a sign of loyalty. Then in return, King, they managed to give them beads which were brought here through trade because in terms of trade, they were traded with Arabs, succeeded by Chinese, then later on around 16th century Portuguese. Mm. So although Great Zimbabwe was the largest settlement in sub-Saharan Africa, there's no pinpoint factor which led to the demise of Great Zimbabwe. But we have other reasons which were put forward by the experts. The likes of demographic pressure, inability of land to support the human population, then political instability, which was resulted in succession disputes among his children. Who is going to take over the kingship? Just imagine, if you've got 200 wives, what about kids? Right. And also environmental stress. Maybe the town grew too large to its environment, like persistent drought and famine, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which was induced by poor climatic condition, shortage of durable water sources to sustain human and animal life, shortage of natural resources, e.g. minerals, and also spread of diseases. So around the end of 1450 AD, Great Zimbabwe was involved into bulging population capacity, and Great Zimbabwe was totally declined around the end of 1450. Forced the last king, Yatsimba Mutota, with the other group to the northern part of Zimbabwe and establish another state which is known as Munumtapa. Munumtapa means Master Pillager or Master Kongara, 
and the other group remain yet to grace Zimbabwe and move to the western part of Zimbabwe to form what we call Torwa State. And today we call it Kami. So Mutapa and Kami, these are offshoots of Grace Zimbabwe community. Okay. Yes, nowadays we've got more than 150 similar sites, which was constructed after the demise of Grace Zimbabwe. That's why we do have Tsindi, ruins in Marondera, Ziwa, Nyanga, Naletale, Zongombe, Majirin, Zaka, Matendera and Bowera, Chibumani, just to mention but a few. Then 1700, that is after the demise of Grey Zimbabwe, Grey Zimbabwe was reoccupied by the Duma of Mugabe clan, which is totally different to our former president Robert Mugabe due to different totems. Just the similarities of names like John John, but with the different totems, because Mugabe I'm talking about is of Hippopotamus totem Gono Chirandu, while it's our former president is of Crocodile totem Gushungo. Mm. Then 1871, Karl Mauch was a German guy, became the first European to see and report on the existence of Great Zimbabwe. Then 1937, that's when Great Zimbabwe declared a national monument. Then 1980, Great Zimbabwe gave its name to the new independent country of Zimbabwe. During colonial period, our country, it was known as Rhodesia. A name after Cecil John Rhodes in 1895, then Cecil John Rhodes died in 1902, and he was buried in Matopos. So Zimbabwe, it's a shorter name. Zeta, it's a prefix which represents something which is big, Z. Then MBMBA, it's a key root for a house. Then BWE, -E, it's a noun for a stone. So a very big house of stone, that's the meaning of Zimbabwe. Yeah. Yes. If you come to Zimbabwe and fail to visit Great Zimbabwe, automatically you are not in Zimbabwe. Because the name of the country originated from here. So allow me to say welcome to Zimbabwe once again. Well, thank you very yes, much. Thank you. All right. So and uh, uh, 1986, that's when Great Zimbabwe declared a World Heritage Site by UNESCO. Meaning to say, in the world, Great Zimbabwe is comparable to Great Wall of China, Egyptian pyramids, Machu Picchu in Peru, in South America, then Great Zimbabwe. Maybe number five, these are Angkor temples in Cambodia. And then 1987, the new United Zanpe political party adopted Great Zimbabwe as its symbol. So those people that adopted the giant famous Konkau Tower and two trees inside the Great Enclosure as symbol of unity among its black people. In short, this is the brief history of Great Zimbabwe. Thank you, Tatenda Siabonga. Now, you know I have questions. Okay, feel uh, free. Now, are all of these stones that are here now, they, yeah. these are the original stones? Yes, sure. These are the ones that were laid yeah. by the people yes. of Great Zimbabwe. Yes. And they have not been moved or touched or anything. Yeah. So, original. All right. Yeah, this is the western entrance of the Great Enclosure. There's some restoration which was done in 1995. Only at the western entrance uh, by the curators here at Great Zimbabwe. And uh, uh, this type of tree mm -hmm. is the one which creates a lot of uh, controversy over the builders of Great Zimbabwe and the archaeological world. Okay. Many scholars, they used to say it's cedar wood. Okay. So we cannot find cedar in Africa. They thought it might be brought here by Phoenicians and the Arabs from Lebanon. Okay. So after some tests through radiocarbon dating, it was known as African sandalwood. Oh. It's a very local common tree, pest and termite resistant. Okay. And uh, the type of stone is known as granite rock. In terms of stone quarrying, these people, they use the process of making fire on top of granite outcrop. After some excessive heat, they used to pour cold water, force the rock to crack. They further shape these stones using iron tools like hammers and chisels. Since we believe that the Bandu people, these are the Elian Age people, okay. are the first people to use the iron tools. Well, uh, while this the, uh, the, the, the latest Stone Age people, we are talking of the Sen and the Koi Koi. Okay. Yes, and the intermarriage between the Sen and the Koi Koi, they bear an offspring which is known as Koi Sen. Koi Sen, yes. Yes. All right, so let's, let's take okay. a walk on down through. All right, fine. Come on through. See, people were building. It was around 1200. It's around the same time. You know what's interesting? When I went to Gondor in Ethiopia, Yum. our King Lali Bella, he was uh, reigning around the 12th century. Okay. And you would find stone structures and castles in Gondor All right. in Ethiopia. And, uh, and so this is just kind of interesting that this was going on around the 12th century as well. And, uh, and so obviously we're not that far from Ethiopia, but this is a very different culture, a very different group of people uh, in Great Zimbabwe. And so this is just another example of what people were doing on this continent before colonization. Yeah, yeah, people don't, sure. Because people actually think that, let me explain to you, people really think that these countries that were formed have always been around. So they think that like Zimbabwe, the country, and 
uh, uh, Zambia and South Africa and Ghana and Nigeria, they think these countries have always existed, but they were actually formed in the late 1800s, but there were kingdoms that were here that came long before the countries. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, um, here now, this is the main structure, which is known as the Great Enclosure. That's where you can see high degree of engineering in terms of stone masonry. It stands about 255 meters in its circumference. Then 11 meters up, another side especially eastern side, then five to six meters width at the base, then progressively thinner at the top to about two to three meters wide just to maintain stability. And uh, it was believed that there are more than 25,000 tons of stone blocks which were used to construct the, the outer wall of great enclosure. And the one thing which made Great Zimbabwe very unique, these were just amazing dressed on all structures which were built without mortar or even cement. That's and it. the purpose of the walls, the walls is like, uh, it's for defense and protection. It's for defense and protection. And the great enclosure, it was a resident or first wife of the king. First wife usually used to reside in the great enclosure. And the duty of first wife just to teach those young girls at puberty stage how to behave when we get married. And the evidence is, uh, inside the great enclosure, there are some sort of clay figurings like male organs. <laughs> Uh, which were made up of soapstone, which were retrieved from this place to our site museum, which were used as teaching aids for premarital lesson. So, okay. th so this is where the first wife... Yes, first wife, she was very, very important, because if you chase away your first wife, she's the one who knows every secret about husband. If ah. it is nowadays, we have social media. Oh, right, right. Yes, she, yes. Yeah, social media, yeah. They didn't have that back in the Great Zimbabwe. Okay, so let's go to, to the main... The, the giant famous Konkau Tower. Okay. Yes, yeah, what we call the log of Great Zimbabwe. So all these all original stones. Original stone wall structures. Only the restoration was made at the western entrance. Okay. That's why it's good to come see for yourself. That's why it's good to come because all of this. I mean, when you look at it closely, you see this is how they left it. This is how they built it. Wow, and it's thick. In front of us, we have the giant famous Konkau Tower. It's about 11 meters high, 5.5 meters in its diameter. And there are different assumptions pertaining that tower. Some say it's like a big phallic object of a male organ. Although mm. a king used to reside on top of the hill, we have got power over the whole state since Great, in Great Zimbabwe, it was a patriarchal society. And then some say it's like millet head. Millet, it was a staple crop which was grown by the inhabitants of the town. Long ago, there was no maize seed. Maize seed, it was brought here around the 16th century by Portuguese from Brazil. And then some say it's like a granary in shape, which represents abundant royal wealth, which was found in Great Zimbabwe by that time. Mm. So, 1871, Kao was the first guy to climb on top of the tower and try to check whether if there is a wall inside. And then he finds solid, he finds nothing because it's not a wall of this, this tower. Maybe these people want to show their architectural experience and also decoration. Although Kao Mao was uh, believing that uh, Great Zimbabwe it was built to replicate King Solomon's palace. He thought that King Solomon used to stay on top of the hill, then Queen of Sheba hmm. used to reside in the Great Enclosure during her visit to King Solomon. Oh. So we call it time controversy because Kao Mao was talking of BC time while he said Great Zimbabwe uh, talking of AD time. And during the lifetime of King Solomon, he managed to construct a similar concord tower like this with a wall inside for putting his treasury. So this one is just a solid dressed on our structure without wall inside. So the Portuguese got here also. Pardon? The Portuguese came here also? Uh, yes, sort of like the first Portuguese scholar to come here to read this far. Maybe he was just coming for to, to do a trade. Mm. He was uh, Joao de Barros around 1500. Okay. Yes. Okay. 1500, yes. But he. Uh, most Portuguese, they were active in Mutapa State to the north. To the north, okay. Yes, but the, the Portuguese north, did yes. get to Zimbabwe and, as well. Yes, and then two trees in the tower. We would say this type of tree is known as a Transvaal red milk wood tree. Okay. So in terms of the ages of these trees, no one knows. But some other theories tell that the tree was just grown during the peak of Great Zimbabwe. Some say it was grown during the demise of Great Zimbabwe. So the one who is responsible for counting the annual rings of these trees is known as Dendro chronologist after cutting the other tree then counting the annual rings but uh, not now right yes and uh, uh, 
these two trees in the tower, it's symbol of unity. 1987, the two political parties, ZAPO and ZANU, they signed what we call Unity Accord. So they adopt the giant famous Konkau Tower and two trees as symbol of unity. So if you come to Zimbabwe, to Great Zimbabwe and fail to take a pic here, other people, they don't believe that you're at Great Zimbabwe. I need to take a picture here, right? Yes, you All need right. to take a picture. I, I think a I need to yeah. take a picture there. This really does remind me of the churches in Lalibela in Ethiopia because of having to walk down through here. But all of this was constructed hundreds of years ago and it still remains to this day. And people literally walk back through here. You can see the walls. You look up the wall, you can see how high the wall is. And you can see how narrow the walkway is here, and you can see the stone on the, on, on the ground is your walkway. I have broad shoulders, so you can see, like it's about to get real tight up in here, let me, let me squeeze through here like this. All right, so this is, wow, a community. I mean, literally people built this 800 some odd years ago. Okay, so this is the other uh, nice place where you can take pictures and then if you see the thickness of the wall, you can see it's five to six meters width. You can see outside. Oh, wow. So these are drainage system just to drain water outside. So it's yes. five, five And then 11 meters up and then at the base it's like five to six meters. For equilibrium and stability, they used to build a broader bases and then progressively thin at the top Thinner just to, the maintain, top. Uh, to maintain stability. So if you look through here, you can actually see outside? Yes, yes. So if you take the camera down and you can look out through that hole, you'll be able to see outside. Yeah. See light, daylight. Look at that. So you said five to six meters in width? Yes, five to point? six meters width, two to three meters width at the top. Oh, wow. Yes. So what do you think, my friend? You can say something. Oh, yeah, well, I'm here. I, I made it to the Great Enclosure. I am in Zimbabwe. Yes. I am at the Great Zimbabwe uh, Enclosure. And I do have a question for you. Okay. Okay, so the first wife, she was teaching the other girls how to be wives. Yes. Now, were they, some of those young ladies, part of the 200 other wives that, <laughs> that became uh, ex extra? You know what? The Jito first wife, just to teach young girls at puberty stage how to be able to get married. And uh -huh. she's the one who used to select the uh, next, wife. Uh, next wife for the kid. Well, go ahead. Yes. Let me find out. Yes. <laughs> it's a great Zimbabwe society. Is, yes. is it still around? The people. Are they, their descendants, are they still living around in Zimbabwe? The descendants of this Yes, culture? yes, yes, they are still living in Zimbabwe. Okay. Yes, and uh, uh, you know, history of Great Zimbabwe is a lot of controversy, like in terms of totemism based. Those people are using African fish eagle as their totem. They are claiming to be the builders of Great Zimbabwe. Okay. And those people are using art as their totem. They are claiming to be the builders of Great Zimbabwe. So yet, Great Zimbabwe, there is a present of Zimbabwe bird. We are going to see the Zimbabwe bird, okay. a soapstone carving of Zimbabwe bird, which was made by those kings of ancient days. Okay. Yes, yeah, so we are going to see them inside our I'll site. I'll see them there. Okay, all yeah. right. So this is where people would live here, or is it just for instruction, or...? How, was this yes, a... after construction of the walls, they used to build the dagger art structures okay. inside, but they were very small. Mm -hmm. Yes, dagger art structures. Okay. African tradition, they prefer to build the houses in Tronda Vomena. Why? Because they believe that a round art is a symbol of unity. Okay. We can sit at round table, sharing ideas or while you are eating, and the other reason is when the breaking strategy. Mm. Yes. So this is built in a circle? Yes, in a Tronda Vomena. So no, no corners? Really. Yes. Oh, not, not on the outside? Yeah. Great Zimbabwe takes almost 200, if not 300 years to construct. Two to 300 years yes, to construct? Yes, generations and generations. They kept adding and yes, adding. Yes, and all these stones were retrieved within or around Great Zimbabwe. Oh, wow. This is the other contributing factor which led to the rise of Great Zimbabwe, like availability of granite rock.
And then this is the eastern party of the Great Enclosure. Decoration is part of their building culture. Mm. We have what you call chevron pattern. The most common pattern used in Zimbabwe for decorating houses, clay pots and so forth. Uh, the symbolic meaning of that pattern, it represents fertility in women, the ability to conceive a child. And why this chevron pattern is situated to the eastern side? According to our Shona culture, we believe that eastern side it gives us hope because that's where sun rises. And then we have standing stones on top of the wall, which represents power and authority of first wife. Okay. So from here, we are going to pass through the valley where we are, we are going to see the places where junior wives of the king used to oh, reside. Okay. Yes. Okay. So now these walls here, they were, I'm sure they were higher. Yeah. Along the way. yeah, they were higher, but some of the archaeologists, the first archaeologists to read this far, some of them, they turned around with these uh, walls because they were looking for treasury. And the... Uh, some of the walls collapsed due to uncontrolled growth of vegetation okay. during the demise of Great Zimbabwe over the years. And you see that wall on top of the hill, the, the left side? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, uh, that's the place where the king used to reside. Kings were referred as mountain. If king dies, they just say the mountain has fallen. Mm. So around 19th century, important leaders preferred to site their headquarters on top of high ground. Ritually secluded as their symbol of power and prestige. And this was just done strategically for defense and protection. If some other bandu groups want to attack the king on top of the hill, they get tired before they reach up the top point. And long ago, there was no guns. People were just using inferior weapons like spears. Mm -hmm. You cannot throw a spear up due to force of gravity. Right. But it gives advantage for those who reside, who reside on top to roll some bigger stones, crushing their enemies. Because uh, uh, the ancient path has become narrow and narrow as we go up. We end up people moving one behind the other. Yes. Wow. Okay, guys, uh, welcome to the valley enclosures, which was about for the junior wives of the king. There's nothing much to admire in the valley because some of these walls collapsed due to uncontrolled growth of vegetation during the demise of Great Zimbabwe over the years. And the trade took place in the valley. And uh, uh, long ago, there was no cosmetics. These people, they used this aloe vera to treat their skin diseases, e.g. skin rashi. So this is aloe vera. This is high. aloe vera, yes. Really? So this tree looks like palm trees, yeah. aloe vera. Even today in our culture, we use aloe vera even to treat like uh, insect bites. And it's good in terms of detoxification. Mm -hmm. And our forefathers, even our, uh, our parents, they used to treat coccidiosis in chicken. Okay. Yes, in domestic chicken. So these are the clones from the original one. Okay. Okay. Let's go. So yeah, this is one of the green five flag. It's a tree which is known as buffalo thorn. Buffalo is thorn. one of the green five. Mm. Yes, and this green type of five. Okay. green five. Like we do have big five, we do have shy five, we do okay. have ugly five, and then green five. So green five, we do have buffalo thorn, yeah, leopard on. orchid, and also elephant grass, the rhino three seal, and also a uh, lion's tail. That's green five. So thorn, in our culture, man, in our culture, uh, you see the, th the, th the spines yeah, of yeah, this got, type. Yeah, you got my finger. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yes. Yeah, All right. Um, the spines in our culture, mm -hmm. they say one is facing forward and one is facing backwards. Okay. So you have to, th to, to look, look to the future and then uh, don't forget the past. We learn from our previous mistakes. So you look to the future and then don't forget the past. We learn from our... Uh, um, previous mistake. Yeah, my previous yes, mistake yes. was I went and touched that thorn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I didn't so know call it thorn buffalo, I buffalo do it thorn. Again. Yes. I, I, I had to put that. All right. My previous mistake is I touched that thorn. I didn't know there was thorns on there, and it got my finger. I learned from my mistake. I won't do it again. There we go. Okay. All right, guys, uh, uh, welcome to the Karanga village. Karanga village is just a model setup 
which try to depict Shona lifestyle and tradition, how Shona people lived during those golden ancient days. So we see division of labor. Many they do stone carving and wood carvings, while these women they do pottery and basketry weaving. So these people they use sopustone. Uh, it's very easy to work with sopustone than granite. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, uh, here is father, mother, and one kid, and these are lovers and the killing machines of African savannah, like Big Five, and uh, uh, these are horny bills, maybe yellow build or red build. The skyscraper of African savannah, which is known as giraffe, the biggest antelope, which is known as the Derby Island, and then king of the jungle, we say lion, uh, and then the biggest land mammal, which is known as elephant. The biggest land mammal, and then buffalo, you see chessboards, and Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe map, two trees in the tower. Yes. Okay. Mm. And these are sub dish or ashtrays. So these guys, uh, you came to the industry. If you need something, you can negotiate the price with these guys. Okay, thank you. Yes. So this is granite? This is granite, yes. They prefer to build the house on top of a granite because, or granite, because uh, it can survive for quite longer. Okay. Yes, more durable to co than to construct uh, any swamp or in sand. Yes. Yes. So it's like a polygamous homestead of one husband with five wives. So I'm going to show you like boys' bedroom, uh, a, a boardroom where boys and grandfathers meet, fathers uh, like a men's bedroom, first wife's kitchen, girls' bedroom and so forth. Okay. So this one, it's boys' bedroom. Traditionally, the hut, it was built close to Keto Crow because boys were responsible for safeguarding goats and Keto as test of their bravery. Okay. So that's boys' bedroom. It is situated close to Keto Crow because boys were responsible for safeguarding goats and Keto as test of their bravery. I don't know why boys' bedroom is situated very far from girls' bedroom. It's food for thought. It's food for thought. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Boys will be boys. <laughs> yes, yes. Girls will be girls. Yes, 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 yes. Sure. So that's the, that's what the cattle would be. Yes, uh, cattle pen. Yes. So come this side. I can hear them <laughs> in the background. Here, here. And then you see that hut, which is totally different with all other huts. It's a boardroom where boys and grandfathers meet during the night, discussing about family issues, how to kill a lion using a spear, how to fight using an arrow, different types of things. Okay. That, so that's, yes, that's boys' bedroom. There's a boys' bedroom? Uh, no, it's not boys' bedroom. It's a, it's a boardroom. Boardroom, boardroom. Where boys, boardroom. Where boys and, grandfathers and grandfathers meet, meet there, during yes. the night, okay. discussing about it. Uh, how to kill a lion using a spear, how to fight using yeah. an arrow, okay? All right. So you can come to men's bedroom. This is the men's bedroom. Yes, men's bedroom. Oh, wow. Yeah. Skins. Yeah, you can step on top of uh, oh. that animal skin, no okay. problem. All right, this is a typical African art. It's men's bedroom in polygamous setup. A man have got its own heart, so that the duty of different wives just to pay different visits to a husband. Okay, and long ago there was no Diana therapeutic beds. People were just sleeping on top of reed mats and cow hides. And this is typical African pillow. We call it headrest, mutago. Okay. So this is the pillow, right? Yes, here. it's a pillow, headrest. And then automatically we can see a man he was a hunter. Because we are seeing animal trophies, this one is for Redback. It's an antelope and then uh, an X. We call it um, ceremonial X head. Okay. Right, for ritual purposes and then brown and white spotted genet. Yes, it's a good pot raiders. It's a carnivore and this one is for Chakima baboon. We do have two types of baboon in Africa. We do have Chakima and the yellow baboon from East Africa. And then a knife which is capable for cutting both sides. Okay, and then walking stick. Maybe a man it will be too old to such an extent that he end up walking like this. Yes, mm. yes. And then um, this is Ed. It's a carving tool specifically for wood carving. We call it in Bezo. In Shona, it's Ed. Okay. Yes. And then uh, Nobukeri is for hunting and also for fighting. And then spear 
is for hunting and also for fighting as well. And then a, b a bow and arrow. These are arrows, yes. These are arrows for hunting. And then a bag which was made from a skin of clawless otter. And this one, it's a musical instrument, yes. Yes. And then uh, these ones, um, you put it... You put snuff inside. So just, you see, old Madala, like doing it to feed the twins. Okay. okay. Yes, to feed the twins. So they put snuff inside. So that's a typical men's bedroom. So from here, we are going to see First Wife's Kitchen. Uh, first Wife's Kitchen, all right. I know she said it all. The queen. Yeah. I mean, it's just so fascinating to come inside of so many different villages in Africa and see so many different ways of living, but then also seeing a lot of similarities. That's always interesting. All right. Uh, long ago, many they were giants because they used to eat different types of relish from different wives. Some of other wives, they bring sort of rice, traditional vegetables, peanut butter. So they end up in young peace and tranquility with a big belly. Then boldness is symbol of wealth and symbol of uh, uh, wisdom. Uh, wisdom. Yes, Bonus yes. And, uh, yes, wisdom. Yes, yes. Okay. That is according to our Shona culture. Okay. And these are nest for chicken to lay eggs. Uh, guys, this is a typical African hut, first wife's kitchen. The hut is bigger as compared to all other huts of other women, because of senior wife and the. Uh, a, a round art symbol of unity. We can sit at round table sharing ideas while you are eating, and the other reason it's wind breaking strategy. And this is fireplace. First wife, she's busy cooking sadza in Shambakozi. This type of clay pot is known as Shambakozi. And long ago, there was no clothes, people were just wearing animal skins like Mapa and Shashiko. And a very unfortunate first wife, she was affected by ringworm. It's a fungal disease, it's very common. And a, in first wife's kitchen, there is what we call granary. After harvesting some small grains like millet, rapoko, and sorghum, they used to put it in the granary. And the duty of first wife just to share those small grains with other women using those baskets. Okay. And then long ago, there was no grinding mills. They used grinding stones to ground some small grains into flour, maybe for brewing beer and for cooking further. So this lower grinding stone and upper grinding stone. When it comes to prepare peanut butter, they use what you call mortar and pestle. Okay, I used to see my grandmother when I was young, she used to sing a melodious song, like doing it like, Masika na mandi kanga nisa, kondi kwiza muti unenjiwa, hezo njiwa, zorira, toda waira, hu, toda waira, hu, chawira mugomba, hu, eh, hu, hu, like that, okay? If a, like, if, if a baby is busy crying at the back, he end up entertained like, by such a movement. He end up sleeping at the back, okay? And then uh, we have different types of utensils. Here, if you see this type of clay pot, you have to think about milky. It was used to, for storing sour milky. And then uh, chipuko is for drinking beer, water, mayo, like a round heart symbol of unity. Maybe you are family members who just want to discuss about family issues. I'm gonna start shake oil here and then drink, then pass to the next person. Okay. And then uh, many African tradition they respect this type of platform. We call it Chikuwa. It's an African altar. Let's take for for insisted that a son want to search for a job in a small town. The family member they get together, men occupy a bench while these women sit on top of reed mats and cards. And those older grandfathers, they took snuff and go to that platform to pacify or to appease their ancestors, to seek guidance and protection so that a son could not fall in bed omens, maybe attacked by robbers or falling road traffic accident. Okay. And then this is a typical African uh, roof. Many people, they respect this type of a roof. Some, they believe that at the center, that's where God is. So all these logs, it represents different types of people, different types of denominations. At the end, they all limited one God. So I believe, they believe that there's only one God in heaven, okay? So that's a typical African art. It's part of our culture. Then in front of us, we do have a group of traditional dance. Um, they are going to dance for us. Long ago, there was no any mode of entertainment. People were just beating drums, playing any piano or thumb piano as way of entertainment during period of rain-making ceremony and hunting ceremony. 
In terms of hunting ceremony, these people, they believe that if somebody going for a hunting and killed by an animal was bad luck, which was caused by the anger of ancestors. So before they went for hunting, they have to come to pacify or to appease their ancestors, to seek guidance and protection because they used to hunt bigger games like Big Five for ivory, animal skins, and also meat. So they are going to dance for us. They are allowed to take videos, allowed to join if you want to join. But after dancing, you have to give them a token of appreciation as their way of survival. <laughs> of Darren and Destiny and Darren and Destiny are twin brother and sister and you go on their adventures throughout the African diaspora meaning so African diaspora destinations primarily focused in Africa but we go to South America we're going to go to the Caribbean their first book is going to take you to Ghana and then we're going to go on a safari and from there we're going to go to Ethiopia and then we go to Salvador Brazil and what the goal is is to be able to inspire curiosity in the continent of Africa, in our children from a very young age, and to really tell a more accurate story. Most of our children are exposed to negative images, late night infomercials about how bad things are, everybody's sick, everybody's poor, everyone's uneducated, but that's simply not true. So what Darren and Destiny and their family do is they go to different African destinations. They are learning about these different places. You're beginning to see positive images, but still telling the truth. I mean, that's the important thing, to tell the truth about some of the things that have occurred. But it's all done on our children's level so they begin to understand it. And it begins to pique their curiosity. They begin to learn more. And hopefully one day they will want to explore and visit the continent of Africa and its many countries. There's just so much that Darren and Destiny are able to do and as they're doing it, it's, it's like they begin to open the minds of a, a new generation and they don't get bombarded and indoctrinated with negativity. They're actually able to see positivity and inspiring images and messages about the African diaspora 
as well as those who are still indigenous to the continent of Africa, and they begin to learn more and, uh, and just see things differently. So I'm excited about introducing the adventures of Darren and Destiny.